I already talked about passing networks in the first lecture, but what we're going to do now is look in Python how we can actually make passing networks, how we can plot them. As usual, we start by loading in the libraries that we're interested in. I'll run those. Then we need to open the data set. I won't go too much into the details about that. You should be getting the hang of using StatsBomb just now. If not, there's a, a link there that you can check out. Run that. Then really, um, there's a few steps here that you need to think about and spend some time going through. We want to make a passing network. I'll, I'll just show you. I think I'll just show you a passing network to start with. So this is the sort of thing that we might want to do in the study on the, the case study on the other page. I look at Manchester United's passing network from a few seasons ago when they had Paul Pogba. We're interested in the passes. In this case, we look at both the passes in and the passes out from Pogba. And the argument is very much about how central he is in the game. And so the thickness of these lines are the number of passes. Um, you can see De Gea makes very few passes. And uh, the more passes there are, the, the thicker the line is, the more passes there are between the particular players. In this case, I actually just keep a constant circle size. In the example we're going to look at here, we sometimes make this circle bigger if the player receives some more passes. OK, so how are we going to do this? Well, one, one thing that we see immediately is there's only 11 players in our passing network and there are substitutes, right? So um, there's either three or five substitutes coming in. So that kind of adjusts our passing network. What we do to handle this in this particular case, it really depends always with these questions. It depends what type of thing that you're trying to answer. But say we were interested in before the first substitution, how were England women's uh, passing network how, how did their passing network look and this um, tries to find the or it does find the um, location of the first substitution here it finds the time of the first substitution and then it looks for all of the um, passes before that first substitution again we're using this idea of a mask that we just sort of sort of want to mask out all the passes that came where their, their time index came, bef uh, we want to mask in all of the ones that um, uh, came before the first substitution um, when there was a pass. And then once we've created this mass variable, we put it into the data frame, which contains all of the passes, and we get out the start x coordinate, start y coordinate, end x, end y, player name, and who the pass went to. Um, some data providers don't actually have who the pass went to, which makes it a little bit trickier to, um, to work out. So you have to work it out from the next event and so on. But here you have both, uh, both who played the pass and who it went to. And then um, we want to do a little bit of a adjustment, adjusting only for the surname. We want to just um, uh, uh, do the surname. And Alexandra wrote this code. He put a little uh, example here that this can lead to a few problems when you're presenting these types of uh, networks, because, for example, Leo Messi's name is, I don't, I don't think I dare to pronounce it, it's Lionel Andreas Messi Cucitini. And um, yeah, so that's not really the name that you'll recognize if you see it in a passing work for Barcelona. Well, mostly, I don't know how big football fans you are. Maybe some of you will recognize that name, but um uh, that that's Messi's full name, and so that's the name that would come up on the on the passing network. So often there's a little bit of that kind of data hacking that you have to do to get these things right. But luckily, the um, the England women side of the um, of the World Cup that we're studying in this case, they have some pretty simple surnames. Um, okay, so first we'll once we've we've got all of this data, so we've got this data frame again. There's this kind of naming thing here. Data frame is all of the events data frame passes that the passes we're interested in. And now we're going to start plotting these events on the pitch. Again, we're going to enumerate through. This is a for loop where we enumerate through uh, each of the different players in this case. And then for each of the players, we're going to um, do a scatter of the mean position that they made a pass. Now, you can do this in various different ways. You can be looking at the position where the pass is made to, or you can look at the position um, 
uh, where the, uh, the you can look at the position of the receiver of the pass or you can look at the position where the pass was made from, or you can take the average of those two. And so in this particular case, we've taken the average of those two. This is where the pass is made from. This is where the pass was received. We can concatenate those two um, variables, those two variables together, and we take the mean. And then we also count up the number of passes that were made. And so now we actually have both the X and Y thing. And what we do is we say that the marker size of the scatter we're going to make is proportional to the number of passes made. So I'll run that code, there we go. And the same thing we can do with the width. So we want the widths to be proportional to the number of passes made. And we can introduce a threshold. The default there that we had was having a threshold of two. I'm actually going to run with a, a threshold of zero. So I'm actually going to show all of the passes that the team made in this place. The default, the default setting there was two if you run this. You can make it bigger, it will show less passes, and make it smaller, and you show all passes. I'm going to show all of the passes. And first, I'll, first, first up, just to give you an idea of what's going on, we'll plot the positions of all the players. And that's done here. So we've already set up, and it's quite nice to break it down in this way, that first you set up finding out where the X and Y positions are. You find out the marker size of the, of the player, which is based on the proportion of passes that they're involved with. And then once you've got all of that, you can make a nice um, plot. So this is something like a, a four. This would be the four here, the, um, the left and right backs out here. Sort of like a four, three, three or a four, four, two. I'm not sure exactly. Can't really tell from this. I think what's really nice about these passing networks is you get really an idea of the formation they actually played in. Um, and this gives a much clearer idea. You don't really need to think so much in formations anymore. You can actually think in the positions they were touching the ball on the pitch. And you can see there's a very centralized group of midfielders here. Mead is a bit further out on the uh, on the left, but there's also a concentration on playing on the right with White playing on the right with Paris supporting her there. Now let's plot the edges. So some, oh, I, I maybe didn't say this, the sizes here, we can see that I think it's McManus is one of the biggest players here. Kirby is also pretty important. Lots of passes going into them and coming out of it. Um, let's run the actual passing network code. And now we have all of the connections. As I said, I've used a threshold of zero. The reason I did this because I saw that white was pretty important here, um, even though she only had, Paris was the only player who was playing backwards and forwards to her. You can actually see there's play, passes, individual passes from almost every player up to white. Uh, but certainly bronze, McManus are, are the key players. Now, of course, you, you have to balance this. I mean, again, we've we've talked earlier, or actually, I think we'll look at this in the next video about looking at things like what happens in the 15 uh, seconds leading up to a shot. So this can be that McManus and Greenwood are just rolling the ball backwards and forwards between them in a not particularly progressive way. So we don't necessarily, it might not be the case that these two are the absolute most important players in the match. They could have just been rolling the ball back. You often see a kind of um, rolling backwards and forwards of the ball between the, uh, the center backs in these types of passing networks, which doesn't mean that that was the most important thing that happened in the match. So it's definitely, it's definitely like, this isn't the only way to see the game. This is one way of seeing the game. And for example, we'll see this in the next lecture, one trick you can do here to get a bit more context is look at the passes that were for the maybe the 10 or the 15 seconds before a shot. But this is the basic um, idea, and we've got a very nice illustration of how they were playing in this, this formation. Now, the thing I want to introduce here, and it's the calculation right at the bottom here, is the centralization. Now, before I do the calculation. I, I want to give you an idea about this, and it's based around the case study I have on the next page. What struck me when I looked at these and watching Manchester United at the time was that Paul Pogba was incredibly central to everything they did. They kept giving him the ball. And what's been found when people have been doing research, in fact, partic particular is a, a nice research paper by um, Thomas Grund, who's a sociologist, and what he did is he looked to see what makes successful football. 
And one aspect of successful football in terms of a passing network, he found that the teams that were more centralized, where one player was more important than the other players in terms of receiving the passes, tended not to do as well as decentralized teams, teams where the passes were well spread out between them. And so we can compare this United passing network where Pogba is very central. And again, he's very central. There's a few different games he's very central in um, with, for example, Liverpool at the time, who were much more decentralized and possibly the, poss I, I don't have a figure of it, but possibly the most decentralized team at that time and who continued to be the very successful decentralized team are Manchester City, that every player tends to be on the ball an equal amount of time and pass equal, uh, be involved with equally amount of in the pass, passing. And so I suppose that's a kind of key to, of course, as we're going to come back to some ideas about causation, if it really is the fact that Manchester City, uh, because they pass a lot between the players, that causes them to be more successful. It can be that when you've got a group of 11 very good players, then you can all pass between the, the different players. So there's the causation problem is, is still going to be there. But it is a, a fact that um, better teams tend to be the ones that are more decentralized. And that's even true to some degree if you account for the quality of the different teams. Decentralized football is more successful. OK, and so it's one thing to look at these plots and say, well, they're, they're decentralized. But a key thing, and this is something we'll come back to a lot in the course, is what happens, um, how do we measure this? And there's different ways to measure centralization as well. There's lots of different ways to measure, measure it. But I like the way that Thomas Grun did it because his idea is very much, I, I see it as like, you know, the five-a-side problem of, um, of centralization. Often when you play with your friends, there's one person who always wants to have the ball all of the time. And what you do is you measure the centralization of the team relative to that person. And I've given the, uh, before I say, go through the equation that we use for centralization, I'll, I'll go through these two examples. So the first one, um, can I zoom in at all? Yeah, I can zoom in a little bit here. The first, first idea, so this is the five-a-side game where all the passes go to one person. I'm just, I'm just going to look at four passes in this particular case. But this one person, the greedy individual who always wants to have the ball, he or she is in there in the middle, and the four passes all go in to that person. Um, so the passes to person three is zero, to person two is zero, you get the idea. But the, pass, the person in the middle, person five, we'll call them, or we'll also call them P star, because they're the most passed player, they get four passes. Now the centralization metric says, well, okay, what I'll do is I'll take that person, the P star person, and I'll compare the number of passes everybody else gets one by one compared to that person. Now, person one gets zero passes, so we have four minus zero. Person two has four minus zero. Person three, four minus zero. Person four, mi four minus zero. And person star, who's maybe the fifth person here, is four minus four, because um, we have that. And then we divide by the total number of passes that were made in this particular sequence, which was four. And we also multiply this by n minus one, where n is the number of people. n is the five people who are playing in the five-a-side game. The reason we take the minus one, if you pay careful attention here, you'll see that this four minus four is always going to be zero, right? Why is that always going to be zero? Well, the when we find the maximum, this P star person, they're always going to be, when they take away the number of passes they made, that number is always going to be zero. So we do n minus one, which is four in this case, and we end up there. Lots of fours here, which means that we get um, four plus four plus four plus four on the top, which is 16. We get four times four on the bottom. So it's 16 divided by 16, and that's equal to one. This is a really um, a key thing to a lot of metrics. When you produce footballing metrics or any type of metrics, you always you kind of want them to be between one and zero for some reason. It's like a hundred percent or zero percent. So this is a hundred percent focus on this particular centralized player. Now, even the worst hogging of the ball in five aside matches, you probably wouldn't expect only one player during the entire match to be to be passed to. Um, so it would be something lower than that, but it gives you kind of the worst possible 
um, case of decentralized football where um, where one player is, is passed. This example below is the most is the sort of best possible situation. In this example, uh, there's um, yeah, I think I've put in four players, which doesn't doesn't help us very much. But we've got we've got we've got four players in this um, particular case, and I've I've left out. There should really be a fifth player here, but but it doesn't matter. We, if we had four or five players, if we had five players, the result would be the same. We should I should just stick in a fifth player here. Or I should change this to three and some. Oh, yeah. It doesn't really. It doesn't really matter. The point here is that um, this player passes to this one and to this one. This player passes to this one and to this one. This player passes to this one and to this one. This player passes to this one and to this one. And they all do two passes. So the maximum now P star is equal to two, uh, and they're all the maximum player now. And every one of the individuals has two passes. And when we do this sum, here it does imagine there's five people because this is my n minus one. But we do this sum, it's two minus two is zero in all of the cases. It doesn't matter what we divide by. And then we get a value of zero. So this is totally centralized football where every player is equally involved as each other. And then we come down to the general formula, also the formula that we have at the top of the top of the page here. The general formula is that we sum over all of the n players in the team. The p star is the one who gets the most passes. Then we take minus pi um, for each of the individuals who has the passes. We multiply by the number of players involved in the game minus one, and then we sum over the total number of passes in in the game as a whole. And that gives us this number between zero and one for centralization. One is completely decentralized, focused on one, one particular player. Zero is a beautiful centralized, uh, decentralized. Yeah, maybe I've said that the wrong way around. Have I? Um, one is a centralized football where there's a focus on one player. Zero is the decentralized football um, where, the, where the ball is equally spread, um, spread throughout all of the players. I think it, I mean, it's very nice, isn't it? That it's sort of egalitarian football. I'm not sure it works like this at five a side because um, the, the level of the quality of the players tends to vary quite a lot. But in general, you can tell the people that you play five a side with that egalitarian football is the one that is proven at a high level to bring the, the most success. Okay, I've got a little bit diverted there. So I'll get back to the Python notebook. But basically, what we do is we go through the steps of calculating this thing. I've, I've added, and I suggest that you do the same, I've added a few print statements along the way here. So what I've done here is I'm first I'm going to uh, I'm going to calculate the maximum pass. And I'm also going to just print out here the number of passes done by each player. So remember, this is the passing network we're looking at. We've got White, who's involved in the least passes. We've got McManus, who's involved in the most passes. And then we, when we run this, we'll see, well, here are the players. Um, play, I haven't actually got the names here, but there's 11 players, 0 to 10. Um, this must be McManus, who's, who's involved in 34 occasions. This must be White, who's involved in 10 occasions. And we've got the counts of each of the players' passes. Then I've printed out the max number of passes. Well, that's 34, which is this particular one. And now I calculate the top part of the equation. So the denom um, sorry, I, I calculate first the bottom part of the equation, the denominator. That's this part here, which is 10 in this case, 11 players, 11 minus 1 is 10, and then the sum of all of the passes. And then I calculate the denominator, which is the max number, the P star here, minus the particular number of passes. Um, and then I sum up that. And let's let's just print out these differences just to make it exactly crystal clear what's what's going on here. So when I print out, I'll take away that, print out these differences. And these are the differences. So um, this was the player who made the most passes. The difference between her and herself is, of course, zero. Um, remember, that's always going to be the case. And the difference between her and white, she did 34 passes, white did 10. So the difference there is 24. We take the sum of all of these. I'll um, print out um, 
Actually, that's the sum of all of the passes is 220. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe it's worth just printing the sum of, of these ones just to, um, so this is the sum of the differences. So now we have the 154, and is the 154 that we're going to divide by the 220 corrected for the 10 players, and that will give us our centralized index. And our centralized index, the centralization index in this case is 0.07. So it's pretty low, but if you look in these types of studies, if we look back in um, the, these studies, the numbers that we get uh, tend to be, they don't tend to be, it's very, it never happens in professional football that there's just focus on one player. So those numbers tend to be reasonably low. And these networks are actually more decentralized than the particular networks that I measured in that Premier, Premier League season. One thing to note here, however, in this particular match for England, and because we're we're only looking until the first substitution was made, there wasn't many passes made. So we don't really have enough data to, to compare those two numbers. But the point I want to make here is that centralization index of 0 0.07 is reasonably low. What you can do to really get a feeling for this is put in a few different teams, put in some different teams into this, have a look to see how many passes they made, and um, um, and so on. Good. The last thing um, is the challenge. And the challenge after you've understood the code, and, and this is what I, I've, I've quite often come back to, is like putting the context in it. So I said, like, let's just look at the forward passes. I mentioned that sometimes you get a lot of sort of rolling the ball backwards and forwards between the center backs. Let's think about who is moving the ball forward and what you need to do in the challenge is you need to create a, a mask so that you mask out certain passes so that you only have games where there's, you only have passes where there's forward passes. And um, Alexander, who made this challenge, he suggests you do it for Sweden instead of England. So have a go at that and good luck.